Okay, welcome to Outlook Bookseller. And there's quite a lot to get through in this one. This is by way of a collaboration in a strange sort of way, in a natural sort of way, with um, Matt at Bookpilled. Hi, Matt. And over a year ago, Matt emailed me to ask if I'd heard of a book called Star of the Unborn by Franz Werfel, which is a book that he picked up in a book hall. And I replied at the time that I hadn't. Then I looked up in the SF Encyclopedia in this edition. There you go. And I read the entry on the author, Franz Werfel, by John Clute. Now, if you don't know who John Clute is, um, you need to get with the program and you should start reading his work now because John Clute is probably one of the most important science fi fiction critics and historians ever. And I swear by his work, even when I don't agree with him, he's got really strong critical base and he's very important. He's still alive and still writing. He has a Twitter. So he's well worth following and listening to and reading his reviews. Great sort of guy. Never met him, actually, but I'm kind of in awe of him in lots of ways. And that book is my sort of watchword. And 11 months ago, Matt posted one of his review videos, which was quasi entitled The Most Criminally Forgotten Masterpiece in Sci-Fi. There's a link below this video. And he reviewed this book in glowing terms. And the videos had 92,000 views in 11 months. So that's really quite something. At the time of Matt's review, my friend Graham, who is one of the other grumpy old men and the two grumpy old men who discuss SF videos on this channel. I know there's not been one for a while, but there is going to be one as soon as I can get one set up. Graham said that he had a copy of the book somewhere, but he hadn't read it and couldn't find it. And Matt had said in the meantime, if I see another copy... I'll buy it for you because he was very keen to hear what I thought of the book. And a few weeks ago, a, a parcel turned up in my porch, which I wasn't expecting. And it came with a letter from Matt. And we normally stay in touch via email. And it was a total surprise, which was really nice. And it included this copy of Star of the Unborn. Now, as you see, it's in a bit of a state, but this is a very uncommon book. I haven't been able to find one myself. And, you know, it's had hardly any printings. I think it's only had two printings in English. It's original one back in 1946 and this one. So it was really great to get it. And when a book is rare, it doesn't matter what condition it is. If you just want to read it, you've just got to buy it when you see it. And that's the way it used to be before the Internet, when you would buy the first copy you ever saw of an uncommon book. Because otherwise, you know, you'd be, you know, you may never get it again. That's the way we thought then. I've since read the book. And I'm now going to review it here and include some comments on Matt's response to this obscurity. But you may want to watch his video afterwards if you haven't already seen it. Though I imagine many of you will have done so. And I've also put a link below the video to the entry in the SF Encyclopedia website, which I think is very germane as to the book's status within SF critical circles. Also, the website which is really the sort of third or fourth edition of the book. The book doesn't exist anymore. It was just too too small or too big <laughs> as a book. They couldn't do a multi-volume one because of the cost. So you really should look at that because it's been expanded and revised since then, including the Werfel entry. So that's really well worth taking a look at. Star of the Unborn was first published in 1946 from a first draft, which Werfel completed only two days before he died of a heart attack. He was only 56. So I'm not really certain what, if any, editorial process the book went through, aside from sort of copy editing for spelling and grammar. And the author was a bohemian Jew, a Germanic Czech. So he fought in World War I, and he spent his life as a poet, dramatist, novelist, and he had very prominent literary friends. He wasn't popular with the Nazis, and he escaped to the USA in 1941 and settled in California. And I'll talk about him a bit more later in the video. Werfel had already published two very important novels, one of which had already been massively successful in the USA. And the success of that book may well have coloured the reception of Star of the Unborn, which was critically panned. Outside Europe, as I say, I think it's only been reprinted once since its original edition and in this 1976 Bantam one. Now, it's worth mentioning here that in the late 40s, there was effectively no genre SF, that is magazine-based science fiction, which was the only SF that was called science fiction at that time, that was of literary quality comparable to the mainstream of literature, to what was going on 
in the world of literature, with very few exceptions. I mean, there were stylists like Cutner and Moore, and there were nascent satirists like C.M. Cornbluth, but more literary writing in the SF magazines came around in the 1950s, and the term science fiction became more loosely applied from the mid-50s to early 60s onwards, when the rise of people like J.G. Ballard and the British New Wave made literary SF, both within mainstream and genre publishing, into a real thing. So in many ways, Star of the Unborn is kind of better compared to work published in the mainstream than in, within genre SF in its time in the late 40s. It doesn't actually bear comparison to a lot of things in genre SF. So we'll work on it on that basis, and I'll come back to that later in the video. The narrator of Star of the Unborn is a character called F.W., which is, of course, likely to be Franz Werfel himself. And the book begins with a modernist chapter, in which the author apologises for himself being the focus of the text. Now, of course, he could be assuming a playful role here, as he goes into a discursive mode, writing about how he needs to find a pen of quality to grace the paper he'd acquired to write the book on, and the search of this pen takes days. So that immediately made me a little bit suspicious that we're dealing with a modernist, too, and I like modernism, it's one of my things. But he then goes on to say that chapter two is thus actually chapter one proper, with the aside that the book is a kind of travelogue. And this is important because this admission that the book is a travelogue does tie it in firmly with earlier non-genre SF, something which becomes more relevant later in the book, and as you'll see in the video. FW falls asleep in 1943, which is interesting because 1943 is when the film version of one of his novels becomes a massive success in the USA. It wins four Oscars and it makes him famous. And the book and the film are both entitled The Song of Bernadette. And the novel spent something like three months on the New York Times bestseller list. So in the world of the novel, FW falls asleep and he suddenly finds himself confronted by an old friend called B.H., who he's lost touch with in the 1930s, and they were both fleeing from the Nazi regime. Now, we're not sure who B.H. is, if he's a real person. My suspicion is that he might be a conflation of people that Werfel will know, or maybe he was somebody who wasn't a famous literary figure, because a lot of people in his life were. So B.H. then sort of draws attention to the fact that F.W. is actually invisible, and he's also dead. But he's been resurrected as a kind of phantom, and they find that they're in an unfamiliar landscape with no green in it. There's no grass. There is grass, but it's kind of like an iron grey turf, is how Werfel describes it. So they are in this future world. And it's this, at this point, things really start to take off. So they're conscious that they're in the far future. Now, BH has been resurrected many times in the thousands of years since they were both alive in the, in the natural sense. And he has now spent over a century in the current society of Earth, which is called the astromental world. The astromental world. Now, it transpires that F.W. has been reincorporated to, in order to attend the wedding of a young couple in this seemingly utopian society. And there is a novelty from the far past. He finds himself in demand, moving through different social and political situations in the astromental world. And after these opening chapters, the book initially moves through the kind of typical structure of the utopia novel, which is already well established for centuries, but with fealty to more recent utopia novels, such as Wells's Sleeper Awakes, which I think, you know, is, you know, quite a debt to this, the Sleeper Awakes there. If you haven't read this, this is one of the slightly later Wells novels, you know, the early ones of the meat very much, but this is a really good one. It also used to be entitled When the Sleeper Awakes, which is a title I prefer, and that's an important one, so do check that out. It also reminded me in a way of um, Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, which I referred to in my recent video on the channel about the utopian works of Mac Reynolds. So do check that out. I'll put a link at the end of the video. But unlike William Morris's News from Nowhere, in which there is no worm in the apple, in most of these utopian books, you get this dystopian revelation starting to occur in the plot and you get that in all these sorts of things. And you do get it in Star of the Unborn as well. But the interesting thing about Star of the Unborn is not so much the things it's similar to, and I'm going to mention them a lot because that is germane, but it's really the way in which Star of the Unborn accomplishes what it accomplishes, which is the most striking element of it. The denizens of the future world, their misunderstandings and assumptions of the past, their gaudy asceticism, their cosseted existences, all naturally conjure up 
the similarity between them and the Eloy and the time machine, as Matt instantly recognised when he read the book. But Werfel's style is very dense, it's illusory, it's at times pastel toned in the extreme, and at worst it's excruciatingly long-winded. However, it's very clear that it's sin sincere and serious. And I would like to read more of his work to see if there are more moments of this sort of arch-modernist play and to see whether in a more naturalistic novel he sort of cuts to the chase more. So I'm going to read something else by him. Now, it's over 600 pages long. Very big book. And as you can see, this has seen a lot of love. It was actually quite fun to read it and sort of bend it back and what have you, because, you know, it doesn't really matter. Maybe one day we'll come across a minty one, but there you go. So over 600 pages. It's the kind of excess of style and the level of this philosophical discursion that reveal the book's sort of cardinal difficulties as a work of SF or really as a work of art per se. You know, remember, this was a first draft, and had it been edited more before seeing publication, which it may well have done, you know, it could have come out quite differently. Though it has to be said that his most famous pre-war novel is also very long. It's 900 pages in his complete edition, and it was initially published in a two-volume um, set, so that just goes to show. So... Like many far-future and utopian texts, the novel is exceedingly descriptive and arguably indulgent in its world-building. But just after a pretty boring series of theological excursions, which are around 250 pages in, which I did find quite tiresome, there's a lot in the novel which relates to Werfel's Jewish yet sympathetic response to Catholicism. And after this moment, we see the book transform into a hyper-colourful, quasi hard SF space opera for a little while. Now, Werfel is tutored by some, with some young men um, of the astro metal world in the art of chronosophy. And chronosophy is a kind of space travel during which he's transported first to Mercury and then to Jupiter in sequences that one authority has compared to John Varley. And I'll admit they reminded me of Hal Clement. So they feel like classic hard SF things. Maybe even Gregory Benford. But really, this section, which alongside the Rococo descriptions of the astrometal utopia, put me more in mind of this book, David Lindsay's Voyage to Arcturus, which some of you will know, again, a real one-off. And when is this date from? Let's just have a look, because I haven't read it for years. 1920. And Colin Wilson was very big on this. And he wrote the book called The Strange World of David Lindsay, which I have read a long time ago. And this is a cracklingly ornate and metallic book. So there were moments in Star of the Unborn which reminded me of this. If you've read this, that'll probably lead you to it. If you haven't read this and you like weird fiction and you like strange space opera, I'd re-recommend this. It's just, there's nothing else like it. It's completely wild. Also, I was reminded of an, a sort of favourite of mine, which there's one video on YouTube about this book, um, and I think it's called Weird Ass Books. And <laughs> I think it's somebody who's quite popular as an SF YouTuber now, but I, I, I struggle to take that seriously because, you know, SF's supposed to be weird. That's part of the point. And that's Son of Man by Robert Silverberg. And this is very much a psychedelic flight of fancy and the pouring imagery events and prose which for me makes it one of the high watermarks of visionary light-footedness in SF. You know, I did find myself thinking of that as well when I was reading Star of the Unborn. So the thing with Son of Man, it's a refreshing work when it's compared to some of the portentousness that arises from, for example, the kind of, how can I put it, the cosmic overbearingness of people like Olaf Stapleton, which, you know, books like this often seem far more profound in implication than they may actually be beneath their actual skin. And I'll come back to Stapleton another time, but, you know, I, I'll stick with Silverberg. But I think with Werfel, he's using it in a different way. So to move on with that, one of the interesting things in the hard SF sequences is relativity comes into it, is conjured or at least suggested by some of the means of transport in the novel. That happens early on, but it's sort of underlined impressively in the chronosophy sequences. And I couldn't help feeling that throughout the book that despite the obvious metaphoric references it made to World War II, the Holocaust, that overall, this is a religious allegory, albeit it's one that's grounded in real politics. 
And there's one moment in the book which stood out for me where it refers to a kind of counter-reformation in religion, which clearly to me referred to the war. And I don't really want to go into that because I think you should read it for yourself. So when Werfel coins terms for the book, even when he gets to his mo most hard SF now, it is redolent in some ways of fantasy, the supernatural, the esoteric. Like, for example, the word astromental is glaringly spiritual to me. It suggests his own mental travel in the novel toward this imagined future. Now, chronosophy, chronos, of course, means time, or sof sophism refers to false arguments often made for political gains. And if you go back to the Greek sophists of the 5th century, that's the 5th century BC, so 7,000 years ago, they were kind of secular atheists and they were very cynical about religious belief. And they sort of thought that the means justified the ends. Now, while chronosophy in the novel clearly suggests its relativistic nature as physics, there's an underlining here by Werfel that suggests that everything you're reading is just metaphor, not literal world building. You're not meant to take it on face value. He is just putting across his thoughts and his philosophy and his, his feelings in, in this metaphor. And the novel also roundly condemns both capitalism and socialism, and it seems to conflate them too with religious belief. And it evokes sophism again, but clearly he was clearly anything but a sophist. He was aware of the dangers of world building for his own sake. And world building is one of those things that divides people. It's something many genre or SF writers and readers seems to think that this is, that is the be all and end all. It's not for me. And it's also the naked lunch. What's on the end of the fork? What you see is what you get. And in a recent conversation I had with Tom Tone and Stark Holborn, and we didn't really go into this, but it was sort of touched on in a video I made last time I saw them, is they were writing about, so talking about Ken McLeod's writing and how Ken was actually writing about socialist shipyards in the 1980s. And I said, well, yeah, you know, that's a metaphor. And I got the feeling that they feel that when they write, when they write about what they're writing, there isn't metaphor and it is just what it is. Though I suspect I'm doing the both a disservice there. So I'll talk to both of them about that when I see them again and discuss new books with them. So this whole thing about world building, in the actual text of Star of the Unborn, you know, he actually writes about the turgidity and the dangers of overly descriptive writing in fiction and how a simple stage direction in Shakespeare, such as Nighttime Courtyard, doesn't have to include the implied details of hooting owls and moonlight. He says the description is OK in travel writing, including extensive geophysical facts about measurements, directions, distances and things. And of course, going back to the beginning, he says the book's a travelogue, which is interesting. And maybe only it's only a mental one. And this references SF debt to travel literature from its arguable beginnings in Lucian of Samosata's True History, which is a satire on travellers' tales, right up to Utopia by Thomas More, Gulliver's Travels and beyond. So I'm just going to refer in the book, I've put a couple of markers in and I'm going to refer to them and read one out to you. And um, there's a moment, this is 260 pages in. But I must repeat again and again that the author of this travel novel, this travel novel, did not undertake his task for the sake of thrilling adventures, nor for the sake of constructing and dissecting characters, but solely to acquaint his readers with an unknown world and a completely blank spot on the map of the distant future. So that's a little ambiguous in terms of what he's actually trying to do here. He says that, you know, it's a travel novel, but it's not about thrilling adventures, which of course do exist in it. And it's not for constructing and dissecting characters. So it's not mimetic realism, um, but it's to acquaint readers with an unknown world. So he says there are, that is world building, completely blank spot of the most distant future. Now, as a blank spot, he's saying that it doesn't actually exist. So it's working on several levels there, which is pretty clever. A bit later on, he makes explicit mention of Jules Verne. Now, Verne, of course, described his scientific romance era writings as extraordinary voyages. And going to another section in the book, not much further on, page 285 in this edition, he says, I'm not in the least interested in an adventure fantasy a la Jules Verne, nor do I have the slightest intention of composing one. Very straight. <laughs> Moreover, my narrative deals with an astromental world and not with a technically materialistic one, such as that of the ingenious Frenchman. 
I'm relating what happened to me and what I experienced and nothing more. So you see what I mean about the spiritual nature of the word astromental, you know, and really what we're getting at, the metaphoric thing. So maybe here he's being ironic as he does indulge in world building, but he seems to be emphasizing that it is only metaphor and you're not supposed to take it on face value. So what happens then, as with many utopian or far future novels, Ruffell then takes us into the underbelly of astromental society, which leads to his part in a conflict that is the real meat of the novel, as far as he's concerned. Now, I'm not going to say any more about the plot of the novel in case you want to read the book for yourself. Now, I remember Matt said in his video that he was very excited and trepidatious about the attempt he was making in the review to reintroduce Star of the Unborn back into SF and wider culture, even if his, his attempt was only going to be a small one. Though, as I said, it's been a really popular video, so I think it's been a great success. Now, I was similarly excited and trepidatious about reading the book and making this video, as knowing my critical cachet um, as author of 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels, Matt has clearly been interested in seeing how I respond to the book and how I respond to his belief that the novel is a unfairly neglected masterpiece, which has a few flaws, as he as he says, he does give caveats about the book, and that's where he, you know he's a really good critic that way, and he does always spot the things which which you know deserve to be pulled out. Now, in the book, F. W. is accompanied by his old friend B. H. As I say, he's rather like Virgil with Dante, a very obvious comparison, and Virgil makes that himself, and he explains the astromental world to F.W. initially and shepherds him through the social faux pas that he naturally makes and up to a point he acts as a guide for his perplexed companion. Now at times reading the book I could feel Matt looking on my shoulder to a degree, seeing where we'd agree and where we may disagree about his status. And I'd say Matt says it's meandering a very long but very inventive and ambitious in scale and intent. And I know Matt was particularly struck by the authorial presence in the book, finding this one of his key virtues. And that's something I'd agree with. You know, he, he is speaking to you directly, even if, you know, what he's saying has many levels, you know. And as with any great serious writer, there's almost no separating life and work at some level. So, you know, so it's um he's an interesting character. So I am moved to read more by him. But in terms of further context, the most recent book I've read, which you know, I, I felt sort of leapt out and reminiscent of Star of the Unborn was Sent to Byzantium by Robert Silverberg. And I read this relatively recently. Its description of the immortal indulgence of the Futurians in this echoed Verfel. And you've got a guy who's been sort of transported to the future. And this is a great book, actually. Really good. I think this won some awards, sort of early 80s. And um, this, I mean, there, there will have been things published after this, which are similar, but really, as time goes on, you get fewer of these sort of things in SF. And utopian novels, they, they become less common, though I know Emma Newman is writing one at the moment. Um, in its more descriptive moments, the book reminded me of Modaran by David Bunch, though this book is a good deal more pointed and savage in a satire and more direct that way. Uh, very interesting read. Um, you should give that a go if you don't know it. That's an MYRB edition. Fantastic stuff. And there is that kind of conflict between the Apollonian elite and the outliers in the book, which naturally makes you think of the time machine. It makes you think of, you know, another old favourite, Brave New World. Um, and in WF's book, there is a generational difference which suggests Huxley and the conflict that occupies the climax of the book reminded me of When the Sleeper Awakes but a figure from the past becoming a fulcrum or a player in a revolution of war because of his anachronistic presence which becomes a novum in reverse is pretty common in utopian SF. Um, one moment of invention in the book where stars are rearranged in the sky to create a kind of celestial news show that reminded me of a story by Villiers de Lisle Adam, 19th century French writer. And I can't think what the story's called, and I haven't read it for years and years. But it did remind me of that, so that's worth looking up in the SF Encyclopedia. I must dig that out. I know it's somewhere under my bed. Um, ultimately, I think the book is best judged against the other works of SF, which are published in the mainstream at that time. It's not really comparable to what's happening in genre SF. And I know Matt said, you know, it's sort of, 
he talked about Tolkien and said, you know, this is just before Tolkien. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a classic on that sort of level. And, you know, it's a big scale book. That's the thing. But I would say it's more important to compare it to things like Herman Hesse's Glass Bead Game from 1943, Ernst Junger's Heliopolis from 1946. And, you know, they come from a middle European milieu. Um, and this is where Werfel really sits more. He sits more in sort of European literature than he does in relation to genre SF which didn't get seriously dystopian until the 1950s. And that's after Orwell. So of course, Orwell was writing 1984 at this time, and that was published in 1950 and was finished by 1948. So the golden age was the thing happening in, in actual science fiction at that point. And it was still a lot more tech-based and space opera focused. There is some affinity with the cosmic meanderings of Stapleton, as I've said. Um, and you've got to remember that Stapleton was published as a mainstream writer. His work wasn't in magazines, you know. He wasn't one of those things. Um, but in some ways, Verfel reminds me of the sort of religious metaphors that you get in the first two volumes of C.S. Lewis's Cosmic Trilogy. And they were published in 1938 and 1945. I think the third one was much later. Um, but they are more obviously Christian sort of allegorical things. Just to talk a bit more about Werfel himself. Now, even though he was famous in Europe for his novel, The 40 Days of Masada, now from 1933, which is the 900 page one, that's a Penguin modern classic. It was based on the role of the Turks in the Armenian genocide in the last days of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and that was during World War One. And this was the book which the Nazis really disliked. And they burned it. Now, especially since Werfel was a Jew from the annexed Czechoslovakia and Hitler and Co, of course, had genocide on their minds too. You know, it's it's quite an important book. And, you know, I say it's a Penguin modern classic these days. But his most famous book was actually The Song of Bernadette, which I referred to briefly earlier on. And when he was fleeing from the Nazis, Werfel settled for a while in Lourdes, the famous French town, where in 1958, a woman called Bernadette enjoyed 18 visions of the Madonna. And after that, the town lords became a place of pilgrimage for Catholics worldwide. It's still really, really famous. It's arguably the most famous pilgrimage site in Europe, I would say. Um, and you still hear lots about it. And Werfel was educated at a Catholic school in Prague. And he was fascinated by comparative religion, as Star of the Unborn makes abundantly plain, you know. And when he wrote this book about Bernadette, it was a huge commercial success. Now, I saw the film many years ago. I must have been no older than 12 or 13. Now, my father was a quietly devout Christian. And I recall the film must have had an impact on him because he urged me to watch it. And he won four Oscars, as I say. Now, the novel is considered rather sentimental by many people who prefer The 40 Days of Mr. Dark. So just one final personal point on this. Verfel was actually married to the composer Anna Mahler, who has a connection with a house um, called Villa Moncone in Capri, which you'll see in my Capri videos. And I speak about it there. And Verfel was married to Anna Mahler. And Anna Mahler's connection with Moncone is that she once had an affair with the painter Oscar Kokoschka, who was staying in that villa. And he drew all over the walls and the owner was really, really annoyed and painted over those drawings. And you know, they would have been worth, you know, a lot of money in the future. So Mahler married Werfel long after this thing with Kokoschka, which was a good 15, 20 years after that. And Villa Monacone, interestingly, was later owned by Thomas Mann's daughter. And Thomas Mann was friendly with Werfel and he used to visit his daughter there, obviously. So that's the world rich with cultural connections. If you know how to look and if you have an active mind and keep these things, you know, keep all these facts up there and see how they connect. So often they do. So thanks very much, Matt, for sending me this copy of Star the Unborn. Um, do I think it's the most criminally neglected masterpiece in SF? It's certainly neglected. Um, I think, as you say, it's a flawed masterpiece. Very interesting. Um, it does have its flaws. It is way too long. But I say that about almost every book over 300 pages. Um, it does deserve a read. So it would be nice to see it back in print. So it's a very interesting figure. And I have to say, I'm going to read the 40 Days book. But something as an aside, one other thing Matt said was that he felt that 
there was a similarity in the plotting to Pass Master. And if you want to read R.A. Lafferty at the moment in the UK, the best thing to do, rather than spend huge amounts of money on expensive paperbacks and hardbacks, which are second hand, is to get this Golax Omnibus. Because you get his three novels in a year, and they all come out the same year. And it's got Fourth Mansions, which is great, and Space Chanty, which is rather like Homer as well. Um, did I feel there's a... Yeah, there's certainly a structural similarity. But I think that structural similarity is more common in utopia novels than people realize people think it may just be my interpretation but i see it in wells and lots of other things but then i've read lots of utopia novels and they can be terribly boring it has to be said and i really sort of had that problem with some of the mac reynolds stuff i read in terms of the psychedelic color the hard sf bits and the climax i think it's it's very very interesting but i'm going to make one more comparison and this is not a comparison at all this is for people who enjoyed things like the david lindsay and um, the Silverberg that I mentioned. I think if you haven't read it and you enjoy those books, I really think you should read this. This is Radex by A.A. A. Atanasio. And I think I'm going to reread this soon and I may even review it. So thanks again to Matt for sending me this. Very, very kind. I've got something I'm sending over to you, Matt, which I hope you like, which will be some of your permanent library. And thanks everybody for watching. And do watch Matt's video. If you're not familiar with Matt's channel, I'm sure you are. Check it out because he does some great book reviews and he's a lovely guy. And this is Outlook Bookseller signing out for now. Bye.